When you look back on your life, what do you see? What did you stand for? And how will history judge you? There's an idea that is a rodeo cowboy. It's not defined by fame or vainglory, but by freedom and grit. For more than 50 years, one man has fought to keep that rodeo dream alive, and he changed the game for the generations to follow. He's bucked trends and butted heads, but he's always stayed true to himself. It's a life built on passion and persistence. Day by day, no shortcuts, no regrets. His legacy is already etched in stone, but he's not quite ready to fade away. He is Sean Davis, and he is Cowboy Strong. Well, I grew up on a ranch, and uh, as, a, as a boy, some, some reason, I just always could get along, and I could always, I was blessed with the fact I could ride. And uh, my parents weren't much into the rodeo end of it, but they, they would kind of let me do what I wanted. And I don't know where I got all the information. Uh, I always wanted to be the world champion cowboy ever since I could remember. A new breed of Bronkbuster. That's how Life Magazine described a 23-year-old Sean Davis in the summer of 1965. It was his first full-time year as a professional cowboy, and the charismatic and college-educated Davis represented a change from the more rough-and-tumble cowboys from rodeo's earlier generations. The Montana native was ambitious and disciplined, but above all, he loved to ride Bronx. Well, I believe I met Sean Davis in 1963. Well, Sean had a real good style. Of course, you know that the money's in the neck, so to speak. And Sean definitely had the ability to get to the front end over the point of the shoulders, turn his toes out and hesitate. And that's what the judges like to see. And he very seldom bucked off. I mean, he, he was consistent. And see, a lot of people didn't know it. Sean really rode bareback horses good too. And everybody, and he was one of the best bronc riders ever. And if you didn't want your horses rode, you didn't want him to get on them now. That's just the way it was. I rode bulls because I wanted to ride bulls. I was a bull rider. Sean rode Bronx to win the world, and he won it. In 1965, Sean won over $25,000 in saddle bronc riding to set a new RCA single season earnings record in the event. But more importantly for Sean, the boyhood dream of being a world champion was now a reality. It was very exciting, but I also realized that uh, everybody wasn't near as excited about me winning the world championship as I was. I was not a party animal at all, and very strong Mormon. So I have a lot of respect for his, for his uh, ability to live in that world and, and stay so straight-laced. I mean, that's a tough gig, you know. He has always been the kind of guy that I looked up to. He got great morals. He was a great athlete. Rodeo, you know, was, was, a, was a, a wild, reckless sport. And uh, the Cowboys then didn't like to talk to the press. And, and, uh, and so, because I didn't mind doing it, I had, a, I had a great opportunity because they'd use me all the time. He's a great ambassador for rodeo. He was Mr. RCA for a long time. When he was rodeoing, he was, a, they'd put him on a, assistant vice president or second vice president and stuff, and he helped the rodeo business. One time a bunch of my friends got in a fight at the Cow Palace and, <laughs> and they got called before the board. And uh, so they asked me if I'd go represent them. I just said to the board, you know, I really don't have a good defense for these guys, but I said I'd like to, uh, they're all good guys, they're willing to pay for everything, and we're just gonna throw our mercy on the board to make a decision of you. And we'd hope that you'd let us off. And uh, they did. And uh, for some reason, the next meeting, they appointed me as, as vice president. Of course, Sean was everywhere. He was a clothes horse. He always dressed to the T and, and was just a class act. And Sean was always dressed up. They called him the bishop when he was rodeo. And he was ornery. He was always pulling jokes. Nobody ever knew it. He, he pulled more jokes on people and everything than anybody could imagine. But he always come out the good guy because they never thought he'd do anything like that. There was three or four of us young rodeo guys that went to see the old movie The Rounders in Paris, Texas one night. And I was a straight-laced young kid. And there was an old character in there named Bull. And he was sort of an old drunk. And Sean looks at me and he goes like this. 
your bull. Well, I never thought anything about it. Within two weeks, everybody, all of our buddies, that was my name. That's what they called me from that point on during all those years that I, that I was out there playing Yahoo. <laughs> Young, confident, and at the top of his game, Sean Davis added two more world titles to his belt by winning in 1967 and again in 1968. By the summer of 1969, Sean was again in the lead in the RCA World Standings and on his way to what appeared to be a fourth gold buckle when a freak accident would derail his season and put not just his career, but his life in jeopardy. It was just a, a mishap where a friend of mine had put on the ranch rodeo in Montana and we were good friends and he wanted me to be there at his rodeo. I think it was in Thompson Falls, Montana. I believe a bareback horse, I think it was out in the arena, flipped up side down on him, broke his back. I turned myself over and when I went to, uh, I pushed up, and when I went to put my legs under, they wouldn't work. They throw him in the back of a station wagon. And they're going down the road, so here an ambulance comes to meet them somewhere. They put Sean in the ambulance. He runs out of gas. And then finally they send another ambulance, or somehow they finally get him to the hospital. And they're telling me how lucky I am. I, you know. I, I'm told I can't walk. I said, that don't sound like it's very, uh, very lucky. And they said, well, there's only five instances that anybody's ever lived through this kind of an accident. They operated on fused my back. And actually, they never did put it back in place. I'm fused it an inch out of place. That's why my posture is so bad. I was in, the, and then they put me in a body cast for, uh, I think, eight weeks in a body cast. It was miraculous that he ever walked again. And at that time, the word was that he probably would never even ride a saddle horse again. Guts, determination, and stubbornness. Sean displayed it all on his way back to rodeo's highest level. But along the way, he also learned that sometimes when one door closes, another opens. After a harrowing and extended recovery from a broken back, Sean was able to regain the ability to walk, but his doctors weren't too keen on the idea of Sean continuing a career in rodeo. They would learn, as would others, it's not that easy telling Sean Davis what he can and can't do. When you stop and think about Sean, he was going to overcome adversity in any way he could. And that well, that's his true personality. That's what he, and he just, made up his mind and he told him he'd walk and then, you know, six months later, well, you know, he was out and then about nine or 10 months later, he was getting on bucking horses. That, that's, that was the epitome of, of desire and determination. And I think Sean's always had that. I didn't think that I couldn't rodeo. I could walk and I could do everything. But the truth of the matter was I had to learn to ride all over because my back was fused. I didn't flex. It, it took about, I'd say, 40% of my natural athletic ability away from me, and I realized that. And I don't think he ever got on any bareback horses after he broke his neck, but then he come back with the bronc riding and stuff. He was a little stiff, but he didn't ever lose his lick or his try or anything. Despite the setbacks and limitations, Sean would ultimately make it back to the top of the sport, qualifying for another five national finals. And while the world championship form of his youth eluded him, other opportunities were presenting themselves. You know, I've always had a certain amount of, of I guess, luck, even in, in bad situations. And they were taking a, a rodeo to Europe. In doing that, you know, it, it gave me an experience in, well, it actually gave me experience uh, in being able to uh, produce rodeo and promote rodeo. While overseas, getting a taste of rodeo production, one of Rodeo's most famous bachelors took another big step. He got married. Sean and his new bride, Gina, settled into Texas. And for Sean, the Rodeo lifestyle soon became a family affair. As a, as a little guy, you know, three and four, I can remember going with him behind the chutes, and I was one of the only little guys behind the chutes, and so and everybody knew who I was. And uh, it made you feel important because you got to go back there and all the cowboys knew who you were. 
And uh, I got to sit in his saddle, and I'd, of course I'd play bronc rider, and I knew all the horses, and, and it was a lot of fun. As time progressed, I knew I had to move into a, uh, a different phase of my life, and I was offered, offered the job at the uh, College of Southern Idaho as being rodeo coach and head of the uh, equine program there. Sean built the rodeo program at the College of Southern Idaho from the ground up. He raised funds, sold sponsorships, and he began to cut his teeth as a rodeo producer and promoter. With what I learned at the college, and ta I take the college kids, and we would put on the events. Well, with that, I, I learned every aspect of the rodeo business and what made it work. It's uh, a very complicated sport. I mean, you have so many, so many different parts of the, from the rodeo announcers to the stock contractors to the gate people to getting the marketing, the, the ticket sales, and it. It just goes on and on. I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Sean took his rodeo production formula to the college national finals, where he served as the managing director from 1981 to 1983. The movers and shakers of the pro rodeo world were beginning to take notice. Basically, the membership, and they come to me and wanted me to run as president. And I had no interest or no idea about being president. During that time in my life, I couldn't even spell politics. But Sean certainly knew the game, and, and I think that the game owes Sean a lot because he brought in his knowledge of people and business uh, to the sport at a time when, when we needed it. When Sean took over as president of the PRCA in 1982, he knew that if the sport of rodeo was going to survive and thrive, it needed to continue to attract new fans and interest and that meant being open to new ideas. The National Finals Rodeo was and is the crown jewel event in the Western world. At that time, Oklahoma City had been the long-term home of the NFR, but one day Sean got a call from Harry Wald, the president of Caesars Palace Hotel and Casino. He was interested in moving the NFR to Las Vegas. Apprehensive at first, Sean reached out to an old friend for advice. Benny Binion had been a friend of mine for years, so I called Benny and I said, Harry Wall just called me, do you know who he is? He said, yeah, he's a, he's a good guy, he's a straight shooter. And I said, uh, I, I would like to talk to him if you would be willing to sit with me in that conversation. And they were very interested. He knew the way the rodeo business was going and the way it was going, maybe part of the finals was going then, that they knew they had to do some changes and everything. And, Mr. Binion always wanted the finals out here, and then when Sean got in there, well, it was him and Mr. Binion that moved the finals out here to Las Vegas. But even with the power brokers of Las Vegas putting their weight behind the bid, Sean and the rest of the PRCA board had a tough decision to make because long-term host Oklahoma City wasn't going down without a fight. And they didn't want to give it up. That was probably the biggest uh, obstacle was, was getting the vote to move the rodeo here. It was tough on Sean to do that too. In Oklahoma City was an absolutely wonderful place for the national finals. I won all of my championships there uh, during the, when the finals was in Oklahoma City on one hand, but on the other hand, I believed, you know, that it, for the good of the sport, it needed to, it, we needed to find out if that big boost would really help the sport of rodeo. At the conclusion of the 1984 National Finals Rodeo, Sean Davis, president of the PRCA, set up a meeting in Colorado Springs to determine the future of the sport's biggest event. It was a choice between a known entity in long-term host Oklahoma City, or a roll of the dice and a move to Las Vegas. It was a tie vote, and Sean was the president of the PRCA, and the only time he could vote was to break a tie. And they looked at me and said, Mr. President, it's your decision. And, and I thought that, that if rodeo was going to go somewhere and that we needed to expose it, and I didn't think there was any better place than Las Vegas. And so uh, I said, uh, my vote's to move to Las Vegas. I was so blessed that Sean looked across the table. It means that, Bull, he said, come with me. We have to go tell Oklahoma City. 
Well, I thought, oh man, how can you do this to me, Sean? I'm your friend, you know, but. Uh, there's a wanted poster uh, still out for Sean Davis in Oklahoma. When you go back over the years and you see how it's grown there in Las Vegas, I mean, it, it was a good call. Las Vegas may have won the bid to host the NFR, but at that time, it was far from certain that the right decision had been made. But Sean Davis had a vision for the future of rodeo production, and he got to work laying the foundation for what would become a sporting dynasty. Sean, I've always said, is a jack of all trades. And, and you need someone like that, or we needed someone like that to really set the groundwork, proving to everybody that Las Vegas can host a rodeo. When Sean was a contestant, and he looked at how rodeos were operated, I think he understood that in order for it to uh, work properly, he was gonna have to have that respect. This was a professional organization. And if you didn't run your premier event, that being in the NFR, in that kind of form and fashion, then you lost your credibility. Sean wanted to, wanted to showcase the cowboy, and he wanted to keep the fans' attention. And there are in very many rodeos that do that, and showcase the contestants like they do here at the national finals. One of the bigger obstacles Sean and his team faced was the venue. And while logistics proved challenging, ultimately they were able to use size to their advantage. In 1983, we opened the Thomas and Mack Center. Uh, that arena was designed as a basketball venue. Uh, it wasn't designed as anything else. By bringing that event to of that venue, you've automatically created an intimacy with your audience. And, and probably the biggest reason that is, is the sight lines. The thing that we've never lost since the 1985 is those sight lines were set on basketball, and that translates great to rodeo. Mr. Binion said they told him he'd cover the losses when they come out here if it didn't work. And the first couple years we come out here, we, we ate a lot of tickets. But the third year, that was probably one of my highlights, is when we sold that rodeo out, and it's been sold out uh, ever since. Sean was instrumental in developing the NFR in Las Vegas, serving as a general manager every year since 1986. And while the event has grown and evolved over the years, the essence has remained the same, a testament to the man in charge. Sean's really not interested much in uh, other people's ways uh, and, and he's been slow to adapt and I think that is a great quality because he's been able to preserve the integrity uh, of the rodeo championship, the rodeo event, but has slowly come along and developed a very powerful entertainment package. Sean never rested on his laurels. He brought uh, live, he brought some uh, loud rock Western music into it. Um, he, the timing continued to improve. He continued to prove the ground rules to make sure the timing went faster. It gets better every year, and Sean always tries to find a way to improve it or make it better. You can change things, and you can upgrade it, and you can add sophistications to it, but the underlining factors are, it's gotta be done in a certain way. You gotta change with the times and what the people are looking for. They want to have fun, but they also want to see a classy rodeo. We can put all the flowers around it, and, and we have done a lot of that because it's in Las Vegas. But again, if you forget that, that the, it's, it's about the contestants and the bucket stock, you ever back away and think that just the front ends and the openings and all the uh, fun things we do, without that, you won't have it. To see the NFR in Las Vegas today, it's easy to forget now just how uncertain that success was back in 1985. But for those who do remember, they are eternally grateful to Sean Davis for his vision and dedication. At the Gold Coast and here, I, I, I December became my, uh, my best month of the year. And December was never supposed to become your best month of the year. Two weeks that instead of, uh you know, closing floors and, and forced, forced vacation, we're running at, you know, 95% on 150,000 rooms in town. Uh, without Sean, it would have never uh, lasted and it would never have gotten to where it is today. He played an instrumental role in getting it here and he played a, an instrumental role in keeping it here. Sean is the man that saved, uh, uh, that saved December in Las Vegas.
the general manager of the National Finals Rodeo, is in a pressure cooker at all times. And with multiple factions and interests to deal with, it takes a great strength of character and conviction to succeed. I don't think people realize what it takes to run a rodeo. And Sean really has it down to a science. Sean has to keep Las Vegas events, the, the Professional Rodeo and Cowboys Association, Thomas and Mac, the contestants and the contractors all, ha all happy. That's like herding cats. When you have all these factions that are pulling at him, there's really only one point of view that matters, and that's Sean Davis's point of view. But he also has the ability to look long range and see things that will and won't work. All of us are very narrow-minded. We see things through our own prism. But Sean can look at it all globally and know how that's gonna impact the sponsor, the fan, the ticket buyer, all of those things. It takes someone who really understands from a production standpoint how to execute and hold people accountable. It has not all been easy. Las Vegas of the best, uh, has been mad at him, the, the, the PRCA has been mad at him, the, the Thomas and Max has been mad at him, the Cowboys have been mad at him, and the, the contractors all over the years have, have gotten mad at him once in a while. But he, but he does, he's very fair, and he, uh, he has managed to, uh, to keep these five groups together and put on a great, a great performance every night. Any, anybody at that high level, you know, they're gonna get criticized. Sean takes it and, and keeps improving the sport. I think he takes a lot of blame that for a lot of things that probably aren't his fault, but he just takes it anyways. <laughs> See, when they argue and they, well, why we don't want to do this, and, why, and Sean will say, hey, I got on 10,000 Bronx, so don't be telling me that you can't do this or whatever. He said, you can do anything to make the rodeo better, we've got to do it. I call him the little general. I mean, everything's accounted for, everything has a checklist, and he just mandates execution. And I think the choreography, uh, and the timing and the excitement of the event is because there is no downtime. Anyone that knows Sean knows he has an extreme attention to detail and a motor that won't quit. Good qualities to have and a job that requires you to eat, sleep, and breathe rodeo 24-7. It's a 365-day run. It starts as soon as he closes the doors, you know, on Saturday night at the last performance and starts again. It all starts all over again. National Finals Rodeo operates more like a, a machine. There are so many uh, meticulous details that uh, he improves, not just from year to year, but from performance to performance. The bull leaves the arena, right? Well, what happens? Well, Sean Davis could tell you who opens the first gate to the exhaust, who pulls the flank off the bull, where, who opens the gate for him to cross back over to where he's pastured, who feeds him, who keeps security watch on him all night long, all those thousand moving parts, some of it take place in that two hours that is the rodeo, but the rest of it takes place 24 hours a day. And the only guy that knows it inside now is Sean. Every performance, uh, he and I would talk at 6 a.m. in the morning. What happened yesterday? What was good about yesterday? What didn't go as well as yesterday? And how we're gonna fix it? He'll be the first one out there every morning. He'll be out there at five o'clock. He'll be checking the stall, and he'll be the last one to leave out there. And that's just, and it's always been that way. Sean was really getting tough on the rodeo. You know, we were running the rodeo, and, and, and Benny and I grabbed him one day and said, Sean, you gotta lighten up a little bit. So we were just supposed to, supposed to have fun at this rodeo for everybody. And, uh, and Sean listened to him, and, 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 and the next year he came back, and he, he did change his management style a little bit. He'll call you the carpet if you mess up. You know, but you almost respect the guy for doing that. But at the same time, because he's so fair and he's so honest, it inspires loyalty. People want to do well for him. And the, the reason they do is he's always had their back. People want to work with him. He's extremely fair, generous, but demanding. Demanding in a way where let's get it right because we have all these fans coming and that's what they expect. He may have high standards and he may be demanding. But that's because he knows that in order to best serve the sport he loves, you have to take care of those that pay the bills. That would be the thousands of fans that pack the Thomas and Mack Center for a rodeo that's been selling out performances for more than 30 years. The demand for those tickets is so great. There's only capacity for 18,000, but there's a, another 100,000 people in the city for this Western lifestyle event. We've gone from 
a sold out show just in the arena to three or four times as many people in town without tickets, watching it on 45 different uh, viewing parties across the city. And there's shopping, there's concerts. And I don't think that was the vision when we brought the rodeo to Las Vegas. I don't think we ever thought it would get this big. And what's really cool about it, it gets bigger every year. We've been, we've been good for the PRCA and the PRCA has been good for us. I'm a very true PRCA member. And I always wanted to do what is going to make it the best for rodeo and how are we going to sell that particular event to the public the best we could. Sometimes I almost stood alone on some of that stuff, but thank goodness it proved out to be the correct way to do it, to keep it in the time frame and the excitement level, because we actually have got a more exciting rodeo now than we had by far when we first brought it there. Every year on the last performance, people would say, this is the greatest national finals we've ever had. I think that speaks volumes about the legacy of this man and what he's done for the sport and what he's certainly done for the National Finals Rodeo. Sometimes even superheroes have a day job, and the glitz and glamour of the NFR is far from the only place Sean Davis has made an impact. To those that he has coached and mentored, Sean Davis has left an indelible mark. Sean established the rodeo program at the College of Southern Idaho in 1977, a job he would hold for 30 years. Along the way, his students, including his son Zane, learned valuable lessons about rodeo and so much more. I have a, a lot of a lot of memories of the the college rodeo program because of course I was there even though I was young I was there from the very beginning. We learned what goes behind the scenes and I think that helps every production because you know what's taking place behind the scenes so you're trying to do your part to make sure everything goes as smooth as possible. You know we parked cars, we sold tickets, he'd put on team ropings, we flew to Alaska and put on a rodeo. Feeding the livestock, uh, hauling hay, all those kind of things. Um, it was funny because rodeo was a one credit class but it really required about eight credits of your time. I guess that part of it was just a job to me that I didn't really have a lot of fun but I just did it because he told me to. <laughs> also, we had to generate our own income. Obviously, our biggest fundraiser was the, was the boxing match. The boxing smoker that they put on there yearly, it is probably the single hottest ticket in Twin Falls. I think he, you know, he created the, the boxing matches a lot, not only to raise money, but to determine what kind of individuals we were. Because it wasn't about the winning as much as it was about how much heart you showed. All the responsibility, you know, I, I, I thought it was good, you know, pack your weight and do, you know, do the things that you need to do to get through life. Um, you know, not just to be a winner in the arena, but try to be one out of it. He didn't only teach us how to ride bucking horses, he taught us how to win and how to lose. To me, he's very motivating, you know, he's, uh, he can, he can really bring the best out in you, I think. If Sean's mouth was moving, we was all ears. It was almost like he was holding a secret back and we was listening for it at any moment, you know? Like, what's the secret to the next step? More than anything, I want him to learn that if you worked hard at something and put your best effort into it, that you would usually come out on top. You know, I knew he had been where I wanted to go and, and I thought, why should I have to learn the hard way? Why not, you know, learn it from him? You know, when we was done with school, Sean was still there behind us. And he's been that way my whole life. He's been, he's been there for us if we need him. The impact Sean had on my rodeo career and my life is just second to none. By the time he retired in 2007, Sean's teams had become a dominating force, winning their region 26 times and capturing three national titles in 96, 2001, and 2002. The way he has set the whole program up, it's itself, it runs pretty much by itself. Well, when I, when I left there, you, uh, it, it, was, it was very flattering because they named the arena the Sean Davis Arena. When he retired, the dean of the college said he was the most famous guy on campus. You know, that probably says a lot. It was a, it was a good, long, consistent run. 
and uh, it was it was one of my most treasured things I think was my time spent when he was the coach of Southern Idaho. Back in 1990, Zane Davis captured the college bareback and all-around national titles, exactly 30 years after his dad. And while a professional rodeo career was not in his future, it's clear in the qualities that matter most, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Well, I think um, the lessons I took from my dad, the, the one that my wife and my peers would tell you was would be a untiring work ethic. Zane was always intense, you know, and he, he really he really worked hard at, uh, he always wanted to do the best. But one day he decided he wanted to train horses and got a background and... Yeah, well, I, I think I, I stumbled on what I do by accident more than anything. I, I had a period there where I had to figure out what I wanted to do and I actually started out just um, breaking some colts for a guy. And uh, I, I thought it was a lot of fun and that's how it started out. From those humble beginnings, Zane has gone on to flourish as a horse trainer, excelling in rain cow horse and cutting competition at a very elite level. His career earnings as a trainer, more than a million dollars. Both my parents have always been there to support me in whatever I did. I've always appreciated, now that I got older and became a father, the amount of time and money and effort they put into helping me achieve my goals. Zane may have forged his own path, but he's not the only Davis in the horse game. He's always right on time. He's right on the minute. Even in his hobbies, Sean Davis's passion and energy knows no bounds. And the racehorse business has long been of interest to Sean, going back to his youth in Montana. The, the racehorse business has always been his hobby. It's not been the rest of the families because they do require a lot of time and a lot of mental and physical effort. It may not have always thrilled his family, but during his time in Idaho, Sean continued to pursue horse racing as a hobby. He got his trainer's license in 1991 so he could become more hands-on. And he began building relationships with some of the best in the game, like Hall of Famers D. Wayne Lucas, Pat Day, and two-time Kentucky Derby winning trainer and former bull rider Carl Nasker. We have really enjoyed a quite, uh, I'd say, a quite close relationship in the last 10 years. See, Sean loved horse training. That's what he, that was his hobby. That was his release. I knew that Carl had the experience. And, and so what I'd do is, you know, I'd visit with him, pass, ask the questions that I needed. And Carl sometimes wanted to talk about rodeo and I wanted to talk about racehorses. Sean was the kind of guy that wanted to talk about that and different things that maybe he didn't know to learn. And I'd want to talk about how, how the game had changed. I think he's had more success in the race business because he has more time to devote to it. And from what I know of the race business, they, this is not something you just break into. He never had the time to really put his time in to get to the A circuit, which he may now, because Sean's a winner and Sean's going to keep coming no matter what you do. You know, he knows his horses and uh, takes very good care of them. You know, if they have anything that might affect the way they run, they won't run. The horse comes first. But I, I like to put my hands on every horse every morning. And, and that's part of enjoying what I do because I enjoy, enjoy the horses. What I do and what he does now with the race horses are very, very similar things. So he knows what it takes to, to reach a certain level. You know, it's an, it's an honor to ride for him and, it, and it's fun to ride for him because he's a true horseman. Sean can go as far as he wants to. He's now getting more time and he's moved from one track to another track up the ladder. Since retiring from coaching in 2007, Sean has poured much more time and effort into racing, and his success and reputation as a trainer have continued to grow. 2018 has proved to be his best year yet. The top horse in his barn, Chief Cicatries, won the first five starts of his career, and this year earned a chance to run against graded stakes company, including a start on Derby Day at Churchill Downs. I knew when he went into that race on Derby Day that he wasn't prepped 
as much as is for, for that type of horses. And, uh, but he did run a good race and we seen that we could run with those horses. And then, then we run him, I believe it was three weeks later in the Aristotes. But Chief Cicatriz on the outside has grabbed the lead. Chief Cicatriz by the 16th pole. And this one will ramble home. He won by six and a half and he was fit that day. I, saw, I ran into him at uh, Churchill Downs, you know, just not too many months ago. He invited us down to the paddocks and, you know, we had a big time. It was pretty cool. And he's been in this obviously a long time and he really, really enjoys it. And, and that's what it takes to be really successful at something and then have something else that you can, you know, have some fun with it. For a normal person, the ideal hobby in retirement would not be rising before the dawn every day to train racehorses, especially at age 77. But there's nothing normal about the energy and enthusiasm Sean brings to all his interests. You know, it's fun. You know, anybody that retires from a job, they still got a hobby, whether it's golf and his is training racehorses. I think it, you know, it's keeping him young, keeping him going. And I feel good and, and I can do things. If it wasn't that I didn't know better, I galloped racehorses up till I was time I was 75 and I forget I'm Sean Davis 77 years old and think I'm Sean Davis 20 years old and I'm gonna take him on. And I heard that uh, one of them slipped out from under him. I sure it wouldn't have bucked him off because Sean would swear him down that he's never been bucked off. But, uh, but I think that maybe was what helped him to make the decision that maybe we're not as young as we used to be, so we better not be galloping those racehorses. It still gives me the adrenaline flow of, of what I've done all my life of, of the win. Come on, consumer. He's coming. Come on. Come on, consumer. Come on, babe. Sean's got more energy than 90% of the people. Up early, going long, and just keeps going. And that energy really really takes you to the top. So when will Sean stop? Knowing Sean, when he's on top. Sean may soon find himself with even more time to devote to his horse training. And he proves that all good things must come to an end. At 77, Sean Davis knows he can't continue to run the National Finals Rodeo forever. This year, a succession plan was put in place to try to allow for a smooth transition to the next general manager of the National Finals Rodeo, longtime rodeo announcer and Sean Davis protege, Boyd Paul Hemus. Big Boyd when Sean ultimately retires. First off, I think the selection of Boyd uh, was very important. Uh, I think Sean's recommendation and endorsement of Boyd uh, was the only way we were gonna have a smooth transition. My initial thought was I I fear for the guy that's gotta take Sean's place. I, it turns out I'm that guy, okay? Yeah, it'd be hard for anybody. It didn't make any of it's Boyd or whoever in the rodeo business. Boyd's very capable and Boyd's worked for Sean for 20 years, so he knows, he knows a lot. I don't know that, you know, Sean's ever gonna really want to leave. I mean, he is so good at what he does. That, that doesn't suit him to just walk away. I think he'll always be there to be part of, uh, you know, hey, the what if, what if question if something comes up, I, I, that would be my guess. Sean's not going anywhere. He may not be the head guy, but Sean's gonna be on the sidelines helping us and consulting us, and everybody expects it to run smoothly. We will miss him. Uh, I think Boyd, can, Boyd Bohemus can do the job, but, uh, uh, but, the, but that remains to be seen. Either you go forward or you go backwards. And uh, you know, Boyd's got a tough job because you, you have changing boards, changing ideas, and you got challenges. And the only way I know to do it is to, number one, admit I don't know everything I need to know. Number two, surround me with experts who can answer the questions I can't. And number three, have my employees back. And I think if I do that, I might be able to do the same thing Sean's done. Big bar. Bar set real high. It's a well-earned retirement from a career that has changed the course of rodeo history. And through all the years, Sean's family has been there to support him, especially his wife, Gina, who is ever present at his side. He's chosen occupations in life that aren't easy for wives to follow. So I think when we, we pay tribute to him, it's important to pay a certain amount of tribute to her too because I, I've never been married to a rodeo cowboy, but I've obviously I've seen it. 
we still got some of the same ideas and, and uh, about what we need to do for the rest of our lives and, and, uh, and, it's, and mainly plan to enjoy our, the things that we've enjoyed up to this point and uh, do it together. You look up and you see, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna be mighty old if I make it 20 more years, you know. It's time that Sean Davis done some of the things that he probably should have done 40 years ago. The future of rodeo is built on the foundations of its past, and it's clear that Sean Davis laid more bricks than most. For those that know him best, it's a legacy that will not be soon forgotten. I don't know that history could ever fully capture all the different things that Sean's influence has had on not just the NFR, but the industry of professional rodeo. I know you talk, you know, about him being a three-time world champion saddle bronc rider, but man, he's, he's so much more. He has a niche in the history of the event that can't be duplicated. There's no one else like it. I think he's took the rodeo business places the last 35 years that it never went if it hadn't been for Sean Davis and what the rodeo, what he's done here with it. And it's made the whole rodeo business better. He, he spent a lifetime to make this sport what it is, and I want to thank him for it for sure. I, I honestly don't think he cares that much about what his legacy is. I think that if you, if you ask him, or if he were to tell you, I think he, what he started out was to try to be a great bronc rider. And uh, everything after that was just kind of icing on a fine baked cake, you know. Back in the summer of 1965, before any of the world titles or grand accomplishments, Sean was able to perfectly sum up the cowboy lifestyle in that Life Magazine profile. After one big rodeo, there's another one right over the hill. It's a lot like going back to school in the fall. There's no life like it, and nothing I want more. Sean Davis didn't set out to be a general manager or a coach or a trainer. First and foremost, he wanted to be a cowboy. You know, all of us cowboys owe Sean Davis a giant thank you. We just want to say thank you to Sean Davis for everything you've done over the years for the NFR and rodeo in general. Good luck in retirement. I'm sure it's going to be a lot easier than wrangling a bunch of cowboys and getting this show kicked off. Sean, thank you for what you've done for our sport. Enjoy your retirement. Thanks for putting on the best rodeo in the world. Sean, I hope you have a great retirement, and thanks for everything you did for rodeo. Thanks from all the Bulldoggers, Bucks North. Hey, Sean, just want to say thank you for all you've contributed to the sport of rodeo. You've worked hard at it. You deserve a break. Thanks for all you've done. Bless you. Thank you. We all love you. Man, have a good retirement. Enjoy yourself a little bit. Live a little. 